morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the 2019 FSIP meeting. And I want to express my gratitude to Renee, to Dr. Lipnick, uh, to Deb Tracy, who actually brought me into this meeting seven years ago. It's hard to believe, but this is my seventh consecutive time coming to this amazing meeting. I do a lot of meetings across the country. This is without a doubt the premier pain uh, meeting that I've ever uh, participated in. And so you're all extremely fortunate to be here this weekend and to hear some of the world-class lectures and some of the speakers and gain some of the wisdom and insight from their knowledge and experiences. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I'm privileged today to talk a little bit about, about evidence and evidence-based medicine and the practice of interventional pain using interventional pain management uh, guidelines. And what, what is a guideline? And why don't we just rely upon evidence? Well, evidence is anything. Anything that anybody publishes can be considered to be evidence. Anybody who puts an article or a manuscript into the peer-reviewed literature can be stated to have contributed to the evidence. But really, what is evidence without expert opinion? And this is really the conundrum for those of us who practice in the pain domain. We have, we're surrounded, we're inundated by numerous journals and, and numerous formats and mass media that provides a, a vehicle for disseminating huge amounts of information. And it's overwhelming, it's daunting. How do we take that information that's promulgated and promoted and published and make any semblance of sense of it? And in that regard, it's useful to have societies and it's useful to have things like the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. This morning I'm going to talk to you briefly over the next 30 minutes about evidence, what it actually means, and what is the evidence which is in favor of some of the things that we do on a regular, daily, weekly, monthly basis. And in the regard of evidence, I think it's useful to say, well, we need to have guidelines, and guidelines are those sets of, of not necessarily instructions, maybe it's a roadmap which talks about safety, which talks about efficacy, and which talks about the appropriate indications for the use of uh, interventional pain management. It also talks about uh, how we came to the certain conclusions that we all have come to before embarking upon the care and management of our respective patients. So I don't really have any disclosures and certainly nothing that's relevant to this educational activity. And when I consider evidence, I look at it from three perspectives. I call it the C perspective, S-E-E, -E, safety, eff efficacy, and economics. Obviously, a procedure could be safe but have no efficacy. So if we talked about the intradermal administration of one cc of 1% lidocaine using a hypodermic needle, most of us would agree that that's a relatively safe procedure. It's a relatively economically feasible procedure, but it doesn't provide efficacy in terms of managing <coughs> chronic low back pain with radiculopathic features. So it's a safe procedure. Or we could look at efficacy and we could find a procedure that really, really works but has inordinate and prohibitive costs associated with its use. And so the guidelines that are created by our societies have to factor in these three features, not just efficacy, but also cost, not just efficacy and cost, but also safety. And most, most often we have the, the societies, the major societies in pain management, which create these guidelines on our behalf. <clears throat> Dr. Manchikanti and those of the uh, Pain uh, Physician Journal have stated it's essential to develop, to develop clinical guidelines which are defined as a body of evidence regarding safety, effectiveness, indications, cost effectiveness, and attributes of medical care. The limitation are the biases that are inherent in every society. So it would be expected that a, a society that's called ISIS or CIS, Spine Injection Society, is going to be looking at guidelines with a bent towards favoring interventional spine procedures. It's natural. And that's the bias that we are all subjected to. Anyone know what, what happened to the American Pain Society? Has anyone ever heard of the American Pain Society? Well, they were put into practice in 1978, so they've got a 40-year history. And they had thousands of members. And they held built big national meetings. And they produced guidelines, some of which I'll talk about this morning. Well, two weeks ago, they closed their doors forever because of the daunting number of lawsuits and challenges related to the opioid epidemic. And they were being cited as being an entity or an organization that was promoting narcotics. And so we have to look at some of these guidelines, including those from ASIP and every organization, 
with a discerning eye, because sometimes we're here and sometimes we're gone, as was, is what happened to the American Pain Society. So evidence-based medicine has actually turned into somewhat of a political science free-for-all. As I stated, every society looks at every clinical problem from the unique perspective upon which they are founded and have their foundation. And we're going to go through some of these. We're going to go through actually five societies, and I'm going to go through them rather quickly. <laughs> practice guidelines. Really, the best practice guidelines are those which are created by a panel of experts. Now, what, what constitutes an expert? Well, in many cases, they're self-proclaimed experts, but by and large, individuals who have a track record of a unique set or, or, or proportion of their work which is dedicated to academia and scholastic achievement, who've published and who've been at the forefront of clinical research, those are what constitutes experts. They look at the available evidence. They've got clinical experience. They're not just pre uh, preaching, but they also practice what they preach. And they declare their financial conflicts of interest. When I talk about one set of guidelines momentarily from one of the organizations that promotes uh, basically non-interventional pain, you're going to see that there's a huge conflict of interest. And these things have to be factored in when you assess guidelines and whether or not they make sense for your respective patients. Unfortunately, as there are guidelines for interventions, there are no, not too many guidelines for diagnostic uh, procedures and for diagnostic assessments. And so, in many cases, we rely upon our therapeutic uh, procedures and interventions based upon faulty evidence from improperly evaluated diagnostic tests. And this is really one of the uh, black holes in space, if you will, about areas which do, uh, does require further refinement and investigation. We are relying upon improperly assessed diagnostic, diagnostic methodologies when we implement, in many cases, our therapeutic procedures. And again, we have to factor in the ever-present entity known as bias. And so, for example, internists and family practitioners will often be promoting medical management uh, for their patients uh, to the exclusion of interventional pain management procedures. Why do they do that? Well, they have a vested interest in being medically uh, proactive and medically managing their patients using medications, physical therapy, and so forth, and excluding the types of things that we in this room do each and every day. And they will typically state in their guidelines that the trials supporting the use of interventional therapies were based on very small samples of patients, that there was methodological flaws inherent in the pr production of these studies, and that the guidelines do not help in their decision making. But the guidelines are very useful, and I'd like to go through several of them with you. So I just mentioned to the, the American Pain Society, regrettably, after 41 years in, in existence, they closed their doors two weeks ago. Uh, as a result of the deluge of lawsuits which were bombarding them following the opioid epidemic and the, the suggestion at least, whether it's real or fanciful, that they were somehow promoting opioid use to manage all types of pain uh, entities. So let's talk. APS has produced some guidelines. Interestingly, the guidelines that they produced for low back pain were created by two, two physicians. In fact, it was only really um, uh, one family, family medicine physician and a marriage and family therapist. And those were the types of individuals they relied upon to create their set of guidelines for how we manage chronic low back pain. Similarly, and you might find this to be interesting, those of you who are anesthesiologists, the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Society of Regional Anesthesia have each produced certain sets of guidelines for managing pain none of which is based upon systematic reviews or meta-analyses. I found that to be fascinating. So in other words, the ASA in their infinite wisdom and the American Society of Regional Anesthesia in their infinite wisdom have based their entire premise of interventional pain on expert opinion exclusively. And I'm going to show you what some of the flaws are in that when I go through especially the ASRA guidelines. Interestingly, uh, the American College of Osteopathic and Environmental Medicine and the official uh, disability guidelines do rely upon evidence-based medicine and do a much better job in some regards at looking at evidence-based medicine than do the ASA and ASRA. And so there's always going to be a conflict. There's always going to be a conflict of interest. Each unique society is going to rely upon what they uh, believe to be their mission statement when they produce and promote and promulgate their respective set of guidelines, and we have to consider that when we read these guidelines with a discerning eye, we have to look for bias. And I'm going to show you some glaring examples of bias in certain societies' guidelines.
So let's look at the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. That's the, the, the father or the parental organization for FSIP. And amazingly, and they update these on a fairly regular basis, the, the comprehensive evidence-based guidelines for interventional techniques really are based upon a unique look at the medical literature. So this set of guidelines, which was produced in 2013 from ACIP, looked at 2,400 peer-reviewed articles. There's never been an undertaking of this magnitude ever in the history of interventional pain management, 2,400 references. And according to the Institute of Medicine, there must be six factors, minimally six factors, which go into making a guideline. And ACIP has adhered to all of these six factors. Guidelines must be based upon systematic reviews, and I'm gonna define that for you momentarily. Guidelines must be created by a panel of, of experts who have not only uh, scholastic achievement, but also who are known to be uh, dedicated clinicians. Guidelines must also be a transparent process so that anybody else who seeks to undertake the same review of the same material will come to the same conclusions. Guidelines must also be clear in their explanation of the relationships between alternative care options. Guidelines must also rate the quality of evidence and stratify the quality of evidence in what was used to make their respective determinations. And guidelines must be revised on a periodic, ongoing, and regular basis. So let's talk about a few definitions. A systematic review is essentially where you take all the relevant, relevant evidence on a certain topic and basically just collate it and produce a document which reflects what we know about a certain topic, but it makes no attempt at statistical analysis of that data. Whereas a meta-analysis, in contrast to that systematic review, takes the same or similar amounts of data and now applies a, a statistical metric to determine what the relevance of that data is. So systematic reviews are the minimum that the Institute of Medicine declares to be essential in determining what guidelines are for any entity, whether it's interventional pain management or otherwise. <clears throat> and the goal of these guidelines is to produce or provide a standard for how we proceed in our respective practices. So I told you that this ACIP guideline, which was published in Pain Physician recently, has 24 124 references. There's never been a document which has been so highly uh, referenced and so highly researched. And I want to go through a few of their guidelines. This is really why you came here today, to understand what the evidence states in favor of the respective interventional procedures that we all undertake. So they found that the evidence is fair to good for about 60% of diagnostic interventional treatments that we use, or diagnostic interventional therapies, and it's about 52% in favor of therapeutic interventions. These are not high numbers, ladies and gentlemen, right? About half the people that we subject to diagnostic interventions is gonna give us some diagnostic information. And about 50% or half of the patients who receive therapeutic interventions are going to benefit from them. And let's go through each of the respective areas of the spine, from cervical to thoracic to lumbar. And I've synthesized what the evidence states. So this is one of the three or four most important slides in my discussion this morning. For the cervical spine, when these investigators looked at the evidence with 2,424 references and made a systematic review of that evidence, they found that there is good or fair, that means at least a level three evidence in favor of diagnostic medial branch nerve injections in the neck, cervical interlaminar steroid injections, cervical radiofrequency neurotomy of those medial branch nerves, and therapeutic medial branch blocks. That's it, in the neck, four entities for which there's good or fair evidence. There's limited evidence for the diagnostic value of, of discography, and there's much less likely to be uh, uh, significant evidence for interarticular injections in the neck. Now, those of us who, who have patients with neck pain or cervicalgia uh, or cervicogenic headache, we like to do injections for, of the medial branch nerves, and some of us like to put needles into the articular space, but the evidence is not in favor of actually blocking the joint in the neck. And for that reason, that also translates in the thoracic spine and lumbar spine. So you need to be apprised of this type of information. Why? Well, if you do a cervical interarticular facet joint injection, that's okay, that's not malpractice. But if your patient is harmed, if that needle should transgress or trespass directly through the facet joint into the spinal canal, and your patient should sustain a paralysis or some other catastrophic event, you're gonna have somebody who's gonna 
raise their hand and say, well, why did you do that? Because the evidence is not in favor of that articular injection, but in point of fact, the evidence is, favor, is in favor of blocking the medial branch nerves. And these are the kind of constraints upon which we practice, which is why it is essential that you understand what the evidence states. And so when we're uh, uh, confronted by patients with neck pain, we should have an algorithmic approach for how we approach that patient. We look at the cl clinical evidence, we look at the results about diagnostic facet joint blocks, and in certain cases, provocation discography, although the evidence for that is not favorable. And then we stratify patients as those having somatic pain or those having radicular pain, and we apply the appropriate therapeutic options on their behalf. For somatic pain, we'll go back and block the medial branch nerves in the neck. We might perform a radiofrequency. And for radicular pain, we'll do an interlaminar epidural steroid injection or send the patient for surgery. There is no evidence in favor of cervical transforaminal injections, and that's critically important. Why is that important? Because a number of individuals in this country have been paralyzed or become quadriplegic during the performance of cervical transforaminal steroid injections. And so, as the evidence accrues, the duty, according to the Institute of Medicine, is that we go back periodically and update that information. And that's been done here. Dr. Mechaconti and others, a few years after those guidelines were published, went back and looked at the data once again for cervical interventional therapy and came to the same conclusions, that there is level two evidence for cervical medial branch blocks, for cervical interlaminar steroid injections, and for a cervical radiofrequency neurotomy of the medial, medial branch nerves. But this is the way guidelines are created. They're set down, not in stone, but they're set down in writing, and then periodically there's a duty to go back and refresh what the literature states for us. And here's, again, another paper from the same entity and the same authors, looking at the effectiveness of zygopophyseal joint pain and the effective uh, therapeutic modalities available to us, showing, again, high levels of evidence for medial branch nerve blocks and at least level three evidence for cervical uh, interarticular injections, which is a, a, a significant drop down, which is why, again, I'm recommending that you do not undertake interarticular injections as either a primary or secondary approach to your patients with cervicogenic pain uh, emanating from the medial branches. And once again, they've gone back and looked at things like epidural injections and found the same type of evidence over time, so very important. For the thoracic spine, I'm going to summarize which, what we know about that based upon these ASIP guidelines with 2,424 references. So the evidence is good and fair, meaning at least a level three, and more commonly level two evidence in favor of diagnostic nerve blocks of the facet joints of the thoracic spine, interlaminar epidural steroid injections of the thoracic spine, and, and therapeutic nerve blocks uh, of the facet joints, but not articular. The evidence is limited for radiofrequency, and there is no evidence at all for performing articular, meaning intrafacetal, injections in the thoracic spine. Very important. Again, should you sustain a complication in one of your respective patients, doesn't mean that you committed malpractice, but somebody's going to pull up guidelines such as these and say, why did you undertake that procedure? When we, we know that the evidence is much stronger for blocking the nerves than for blocking the joints. And just as we had in the cervical spine, we have an algorithmic approach for how we manage pain of the thoracic spine. We consider patients based on our clinical evaluation and the results of facet joint nerve blocks as well as discography. We stratify patients as those with either somatic pain or radicular pain. And then just as for the cervical spine, we treat them accordingly with our either our nerve blocks of the <coughs> facet joint nerves or interlaminar injections if it's a radiculopathic type of process. What about the evidence for implantable devices? Well, the evidence, according to, oh, I'm sorry, according to ASIP and these 2,424 references which were reviewed, is that the evidence is good and fair using spinal cord stimulation for failed back surgery syndrome. Other societies have found that the evidence is good and fair also for complex regional pain syndrome in addition to failed back surgery syndrome. I'm going to go through that with you momentarily. However, the, the evidence in favor of using intrathecal drug delivery systems is actually limited which you might find to be interesting. This is a very busy slide. We'll spend no time on it. I'm going to summarize it for you. This relates to what the ASIP guidelines are and the evidence in terms of uh, lumbar pain proce uh, procedures or lumbar interventions for pain of the lumbar spine. So the evidence is good and fair for the following nine uh, contingencies. Diagnostic facet joint nerve blocks and radiofrequency.
diagnostic SI joint injections and cooled RF of the SI joint. For radicular pain, meaning not just low back pain, but pain where there's radiation along the segmental spinal nerve, the evidence is good and fair for either caudal, interlaminar, or transforaminal injections. So the evidence is good for all the three things that we typically use and apply to our respective patients with radiculopathic pain. However, for axial pain or discogenic pain, the evidence is good and fair only for caudals and interlaminar injections, but not transforaminals. For fell back surgery syndrome, the evidence is good only for caudal injections. Again, very important when you make a selection for your patient. If you were going to do an interlaminar injection on a patient with a, a scar in their lumbar spine and you get a wet tap or you get arachnoiditis, somebody's going to go back and pull up this evidence and say, why did you do that? The evidence is good only using caudal injections for that patient with fell back surgery syndrome, not for interlaminar and not for transforaminal injections. For spinal stenosis, all three approaches, caudal, transforaminal, interlaminar, all are effective. Therapeutic medial branch blocks, not just diagnostic, the evidence is good to fair. <clears throat> the evidence is good to fair for percutaneous adhesiolysis and lumbar provocation discography. Now what might surprise you is that we have very limited or no evidence for the following eight contingencies. Selective nerve root blocks. The surgeon tells you, I want to operate on this patient, but I'm not sure whether I should do fusion at L4-5 or L5-S1. Please do a selective nerve root block and tell me which level is affected. That doesn't work, so don't be fooled. <clears throat> Using transforaminal injections for axial or discogenic pain doesn't work. Using transforaminal injections for failed back surgery syndrome, no evidence. Intraarticular facet joint blocks. You see the theme. I told you that the evidence is very, very weak in the cervical spine, it's very weak in the thoracic spine, and it's basically non-existent in the lumbar spine. Doesn't mean you're committing malpractice. If you want to put that needle in the joint, it just means that if something happens, you don't have the evidence to support why you selected that for your practice. Block the nerves. You can also use the blocking of the nerve as a provocation maneuver should you elect to perform a radiofrequency neurotomy for your patient. And you can read this. I think it's important to understand what the evidence is in favor of certain modalities and where it doesn't exist. And just as we stratified our respective patients in the cervical spine and thoracic, we do so as well uh, for lumbar pain, low back pain, uh, based on clinical evaluation, and based on the results of things like provocation, discography, facet joint, nerve blocks, and SI joint injections, or of course for um, uh, steroid injections for radiculopathic pain. <clears throat> so pain is either somatic or pain is radicular, and we treat that patient in a similar algorithmic fashion using these guidelines as we would for cervicogenic problems or for thoracogenic problems. We, we categorize the patients and we apply the appropriate therapeutic modality. Well, let's go through some of the other societies. I showed you what ACIP's guidelines were. And I went through a document which is more than 100 pages long and has 2,400 references. So <clears throat> you have two options. You can go back and read the entire document. It'll take you about two weeks. Or you can take my PowerPoint and just go back and look at those important slides where I've summarized everything on your behalf. What about the Spine Injection Society? And so interestingly, they've made some attempts at trying to provide guidelines for managing chronic pain. Actually, they looked at the effectiveness and risks of fluoroscopically guided cervical medial branch, RFA, and they found that the evidence is pretty good in favor of that, just exactly the same as the way ISIS did, I mean, uh, ASIP did. But the caveat here is that CIS, or Spine Injection Society, said this only works if you follow these procedures exactly as we describe them in our handbook. And that's one thing that's unique about CIS, and that, uh, that basically uh, is one of the defining characteristics of them in contradistinction to ASIP. ASIP doesn't say you've got to do it exactly our way, but CIS says you've got to do it exactly our way. As expected, they found no benefit, CIS found no benefit for doing epidural steroid injections without the benefit of fluoroscopy. I think most of us would agree that the, the lack of doing uh, fluoroscopically guided or CT scan guided assisted procedures is probably not a great idea. They also looked at lumbar interlaminar epidural steroid injections. Now, when they first published this early on in 2017, they said that the evidence was weak in favor of interlaminar injections. However, a few months later in the same journal, they went back and said, well, actually, we take that back because not all epidural steroid injections were created equal. 
An interlaminar injection using a parasagittal approach or off midline approach is actually as good as a transframinal injection. I'll show you where some of the data is to support that. What about the International Association for the Study of Pain? Have they created guidelines? Interestingly, they did, going way back to 2013 for low back pain and for other contingencies. A very distinguished group of individuals met. It was uh, 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 Robert Dworkin was one of them, uh, Sean Mackey, Bob Levy, and others, John Loser. And, of course, I told you at the beginning of this lecture that you've got to be aware of bias when you read the literature. So was this a biased attempt by the International Association for the Study of Pain to give guidelines? Absolutely. All of these authors had their entire uh, meeting paid for. They had honoraria that extended into many thousands of dollars. They had an unrestricted support from the pharmaceutical industry to create a set of guidelines. Right? So all authors received many thousands of dollars for participating. This is what I think about when I hear about that. And what did they find? They found that the evidence was more favorable for medical management of patients than it was for interventional therapy. In point of fact, they found that there were four weak recommendations for interventions, which only included things like um, epidural injections for herpes zoster, steroid injections for radiculopathy, spinal cord stimulator use for failed back surgery syndrome, and spinal cord stimulator use for CRPS. But in every other case, they found that medical and primarily opioid-based management was superior to interventional pain therapy. Canadian Pain Society made a very weak attempt at giving guidelines several years ago. They looked at several different pain <coughs> entities and found the evidence for most interventions is weak or insufficient. Now, I, I looked at this paper, I read it very carefully. This is the Canadian Pain Society. ASIP had 2,424 references Canadian Pain Society had 19 total references. So you've got to read the literature with a discerning eye. You've got to know who the authors are, what their backgrounds are, what their biases and special interests are, and how much work they put into their guidelines. 19 total papers into the Canadian Pain Society guidelines. I want to talk a little bit about the inconvenient truth of epidural steroid injections. And so if you look at the anatomy, the anatomy is pretty straightforward. We have an area of nociception at the dorsal root ganglion where the seven chemical mediators of inflammation are liberated from damaged or injured discs, right? We have histamine, lactate, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and phospholipase A2. That's the primordial soup of inflammation when you have a disc which is injured or damaged. And our nerves respond to those seven chemicals, histamine, lactate, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, phospholipase A2. And we have options available to us, many. By convention, we inject steroids close to that DRG, and we can do an, that using an interlaminar approach or a transframinal approach. So, has anybody looked at this in reference to creating guidelines? Let's look at the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. Do they create guidelines? Well, yes and no. They produced this document a few years back with some noteworthy authors, 317 references, and they came to a conclusion. They didn't do a systematic review, they didn't do a meta-analysis, they just pulled together a fairly large set of documents, 317, and their conclusion was that transferaminal injections were the best way to block radiculopathic pain. And what do they base that on? Well, they based it on this figure from Jim Rathmel's book that said, well, of course the transferaminal injection puts the medication directly over the DRG, and that's really the way to go. Of course, not all interlaminar injections are created equal. There are many ways to get your medication to that affected DRG, including a parasagittal or off midline interlaminar approach. And does that even work? So let's go through again my principles C, safety, efficacy, and economics. And going back to April 23rd of 2014, the United States Food and Drug Administration produced this document, which should have scared everybody in this room, right? They said epidural steroid injections can cause loss of vision or blindness, stroke, paralysis, death. How many of your patients would accept an epidural injection if you said, hey, you can get blind, you can have a stroke, you can be paralyzed, or you could die? So this is a few years back. And a bunch of us went down to Silver Springs, Maryland in October of 2014 to fight the FDA. We found that these guidelines were very, very faulty. Now, why were the guidelines faulty? Well, the guidelines had 17 references 
associated with their use. So 15 of the 17 references were about transforaminal ejection. So we went back and we asked the FDA to modify their language. They shouldn't be telling patients, or they shouldn't be asking us to tell patients that epidural steroid injections cause stroke, blindness, paralysis, and death. It's simply not true. But if you were to remove the word epidural in their document, everywhere that it was found, and if you were to put the word transforaminal in, well, that actually makes sense, because 15 out of the 17 references that the United States Food and Drug Administration used for their document are only referencing transforaminal injections. Mm. And so we, we actually went back and asked this multidisciplinary pain society or multi-society pain working group to change their recommendations. What were their recommendations? Well, their recommendations were that every patient who had an epidural injection should have digital subtraction angiography or cine angiography associated with its use. And that's the way that they said it would be safe to get the medication to this target. N stands for the nerve root. Right in front of the nerve root or ventral to the nerve root, we see the radicular medullary artery. And the goal, of course, is to put your needle with a transforaminal injection as close to the nerve root as possible without violating that radicular medullary artery. And so, <clears throat> immediately when the uh, multidisciplinary working group came forth with their recommendations, there was a patient paralyzed at Nor Northwestern University in Chicago by a very, very talented group of anesthesiology pain practitioners. Mm -hmm. And the unique feature of this paralysis case was that the patient had both a test dose of lidocaine, local anesthetic, and digital subtraction angiography was used. And this is, these are the actual DSA images from the case. And then they put the needle in at L5S1, they injected the test dose with lidocaine, the patient didn't complain, and then they injected triamcinolone, or Kenalog, into the patient's transforaminal space. Within, and within three seconds of the injection, the patient screamed out in agonizing, excruciating pain and clutched his chest. And after he clutched his chest, he became completely paralyzed from the middle of his chest all the way down to his toes. And within 45 minutes of the injection, the patient went for this MRI with gadolinium. And you can see that there's a huge infarct at T7 from this L5S1 transforaminal injection. So here's another case, also from Chicago, of a patient who was paralyzed using a transforaminal injection at L5S1. Transforaminal injection L5S1 with, without digital subtraction angiography, and the settlement was made for $2.3 million. And so DSA use is not beneficial. DSA use, I'm getting done, Jesse. I have about two more minutes. I'm, I'm cutting into other people's time. I'm gonna finish up quick. DSA, or digital subtraction angiography, does not distinguish between artery and veins, but in point of fact, is only useful for seeing venous structures. And George Chang Chen and I and others, uh, uh, including individuals in this room, created a document looking at more than 383 articles that found that DSA is essentially worthless and not worth the cost uh, of adding it to your armamentarium, nor the radiation exposure to you and to your patients. So let's just go through the last two or three slides here. Transforaminal injections are useful, they're good, but really an interlaminar parasaginal approach gives you the same effect. Nick Nezovich, my director of clinical research and vice chair of the Department of Anesthesia, who's gonna be speaking to you, is in the room. And we looked at this and, and did a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that were ever done and found that it didn't matter whether you gave your patient a transforaminal injection or an interlaminar injection for lumbar radiculopathic pain. The outcomes were the same in terms of pain reduction and functionality. It makes no difference. So why do we do transforaminal injections? Well, some of us believe them to be more efficacious. That's not true. The simple fact is, is that we are reimbursed at about 150% of what we're reimbursed for when we do interlaminar injections. A beta guy did the same studies and found no difference between transforaminal injections and interlaminar injections. The same study was conducted by Leo Capurel and others who found no difference between transforaminal injections and interlaminar injections. And so the premise is, can we get the medication into the ventral epidural space using an interlaminar approach? Nigel Chirac <coughs> at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York has shown us that we can do that. This is Nigel Chirac. And we found that a, a parasagittal technique is just as good as a transforaminal. I'm gonna finish and get to the final slide here. Basically, dexamethasone has been used, but there's no evidence of any longitudinal studies that show that dexamethasone is as efficacious as particulate steroids. 
So in conclusion, I'd like to finish up. All this information is available to you. Guidelines have been created by the Interventional Pain Societies without any doubt whatsoever. With its 2,424 references, the ASIP guidelines are the standard upon which all other guidelines ought to be, to be uh, founded. And there's obviously some significant bias in many of our societies. I think you should go back and look as to whether or not your patients would benefit from using a transforaminal or an interlaminar injection. Sorry for being five minutes over, but I thank you for your time and attention this morning. Thank you.